by everybody in science because it is it's pretty amazing. One of the things I found in the very beginning of it is so <clears throat> there were seven thousand described diseases. How many of those seven thousand have a treatment? Any guesses? A treatment? A treatment. At least one treatment for it. That is pretty high, huh? 2,000. 500. I was shocked. Wow. 500. And some of it is due to the science that we're going to talk about. So, all right. So, so just for Yeah, I have it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So, again, this was the book, uh, Rigor Mortis. And one of the things that I really liked in it was, um, well, many things, but something I took away was this provada, provanda e riprovanda. Does anybody know what that means in Italian? Provanda e riprovanda. Try and try again. Test and test, test and retest. Yes, exactly. And this was from just after Galileo died. Around 1642, there was a group of experimentalists in Italy, and they began publishing their work. And their motto was test and test again. And I think that certainly holds true to what we're what we're doing today. <clears throat> so scientific rigor and reproducibility. Easy definitions, right? Okay, so I looked them up. So NIH has a definition of scientific rigor: the smooth application of a scientific method to ensure robust and unbiased experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of results. This includes full transparency and reporting experimental details so that others may reproduce and extend the findings. Okay, that sounded pretty good. But then you get to reproducibility and it's a different story. So this was from the NSF subcommittee on replicability in science. So reproducibility according to them refers to the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study using the same materials as were used by the original investigator make sense or is it? So then I came across this paper. What does research reproducibility mean? And so this was from a group out in California, Steve Goodman and John Ionotis, and they've been spending a lot of time thinking about the problem of reproducibility in science. And a lot of this stemmed from the issues with preclinical research then not leading to treatments down the road. So they actually proposed a new lexicon for research reproducibility, and they've broken it down into three. Methods reproducibility, which captures the original meaning of the word, and they refer to this as the ability to implement as exactly as possible the experimental and computational procedures with the same data and tools to obtain the same results. <clears throat> they then coined re results reproducibility, which was previously described as replication. So that's one of the issues. There are a lot of synonyms that one can use. And this is the production of corroborating results in a new study having followed the same experimental methods. And then their third group is inferential reproducibility, the making of knowledge claims of similar strength from a study replication or reanalysis. And then they put this chart here where they looked in, under uh, Scopus and they searched for the words um, research reproducibility, reproducibility research, reproducibility results, on and on in abstracts and titles of papers. And they found this curve um, for many different disciplines of science, how since 1970 up to about 2012, it has really spiked <clears throat> in the last uh, 10, 15 years, as people begin to think more and more about these issues. So if you're a fan of Sherlock Holmes, I am. <clears throat> and this was a, a recent book by Maria Konnikova called Mastermind, Discovering the Sherlock Holmes in All of Us. And this was a quote I took from it. And she says, begin with a healthy dose of skepticism instead of a credulity that is in your mind's natural state. While Watson is quick to jump to conclusions, Holmes forces himself to reserve judgment until he has all the facts, a more effective path. Once people reach a theory, they tend to single-mindedly focus on confirming it, regardless of the facts, thus inviting error. 
Holmes knows that if he comes too quickly to a judgment, he'll miss much of the evidence against it and pay more attention to the elements that are in its favor. And I think that's a trap that we as scientists tend to fall into, is that we have our own pet hypotheses and we tend to be blinded sometimes to results that don't confirm or adhere to those. I, I think that what Holmes, or what she said, that Holmes believed was, was very accurate. So here are some thoughts on rigor and reproducibility that I came up with. And I thought that it could drive um, the discussion <clears throat> once this presentation is done. So a lot of this began with <coughs> clinical trials. So it was a paper by Ed Begley um, a number of years back. And he was working for Amgen at the time. And he decided to, to go into the literature and look at 65 what he called paradigm shifting papers that were preclinical research. Mm -hmm. And he said, let's see how many of those we can reproduce here at Amgen. And results were 11% could be reproduced, either at Amgen itself or asking the original investigators to go back and redo their, their work, which they would pay for, but to see if they could reproduce it themselves. In almost every instance, they couldn't. And so he published this, and it um, caused uh, quite a bit of controversy. A lot of this can be attributed to the batch effect. And we can talk about the batch effect again during the discussion. Clinical diagnostics. So in our lab, in the uh, Microscopy Imaging Center, we also do some clinical diagnostics. So we are licensed by the College of American Pathologists which means that we have to have SOPMs. So we get inspected on a biannual basis and all of our procedures are checked. And so at least in the diagnostic world, the rigor and the reproducibility that we are subjected to uh, are, are very intense. That's not often the case in basic research. So if you think about basic research, um, let's think about those who are doing studies with animals. What are the number of animals that you need for a study? Power calculations will oftentimes give you that number, but unfortunately, oftentimes it's driven by how much money is available to house and maintain the animals. So this was um, a group called the AL ALS Therapy Development Institute down in Boston. And as the name implies, they're looking at treatments for ALS. So they. Uh, focused this institute specifically on one disease. They did a very similar thing like Begley. So they went back and they looked at all the preclinical papers and they wanted to know why are there no successful drugs for ALS at this point. And when they went back and looked at the preclinical data from the animal studies, they were shocked at the lack of rigor in those studies. Some of the um, papers published um, experimental results on these drug treatments using animal groups of four animals. So this institute is now doing, redoing these studies and they're using 32 animals per group. Who can afford to do that in academia? They get no funding from NIH because they said NIH will never fund them to do this. And if they did, they couldn't afford it anyway. So they rely on donors, exclusively on donors, but they're redoing all the studies using very large groups of animals. Uh, blinded analysis, <clears throat> they found that in many instances, the investigators were not blinded to the experimental groups. Statistics, so I mean, this is something that has become quite an issue with respect to p-hacking and, and hacking. Do we, is everyone familiar with these terms, p-hacking? So p-hacking, so the, the p-value, so p-hacking is basically running the data every which way you can until you reach 0 0.05 and then you stop and that's what you present, okay? Harking is the hypothesis after the results are known. Mm -hmm. So you look at all your data and you say, oh wow, here's something significant and you go back and change the hypothesis. So this is something that's, that's quite an issue today as well. Uh, good laboratory practices, our laboratories using them. I mean, industry certainly does, but research labs not as often. There has been a call for something which is being referred to as good institutional practices, where an institution actually mandates these are the types of uh, rigor and reproducibility that we expect from the institute. <clears throat> the agents. 
So this is another big issue, something that I think about a lot um, in the facility because in, in my own research, as well as people who come in and use our facility, as well as being a, a journal editor, the um, validity of antibodies. So a lot of these studies which fell down here were due to the bat batch effect the majority were actually antibodies that weren't specific that ended up causing a lot of the issues. Validated cell lines. How many here who are using cell lines have actually validated them to make sure they're the cell lines that you think they are? Maybe everyone's doing it, but an awful lot of papers have been published. <clears throat> um, the, the most egregious example was um, a cell line which was purported to be um, a breast cancer cell line and was used in thousands of papers, and when someone finally took the time to validate it, it was a melanoma cell line. It was cancer, but nevertheless, it wasn't breast cancer, which everyone thought they, was working, they were working with. So there is a, um, also an initiative, initiative now called the RRIDs, Research Resource Identifiers. Have people heard of those? We'll get to that in just a moment as well. And then publishing, so journals, have a, uh, a role to play in this as well. And there are predatory journals, and as Professor Irvin just mentioned, impact factor plays a role in some of this. Okay. So <clears throat> Bagley wrote a, another commentary based upon his paper. And he said, these are questions researchers should ask regarding experimental reproducibility. So whenever you're reading a paper, you should think about, were the experiments performed in a blinded manner? Were the experiments repeated multiple times? were all of the results presented, not just cherry-picked showing the best results, were positive and negative controls included, were valid and validated reagents used, and were appropriate statistical tests used. I think we as scientists all assume that the answer to these are all yes, but in fact, if we really get into the weeds, we find that oftentimes that's not the case. <clears throat> so NIH has taken um, We've taken a good look at this, and this is from the a FASA Washington update from October of this year. <clears throat> so it says NIH um, to enhance rigor and reproducibility of basic biomedical research. Um, we discussed in a meeting that they held there, noting that NIH efforts alone will not affect real change. The deputy director stressed the need for all stakeholders, individual researchers, professional societies, research institutions, and scientific journals to engage in efforts to enhance reproducibility and transparency of scientific studies. Building on this idea, Tim Errington at the Meta Science Activity Center for Open Science discussed some of the common roadblocks and challenges when reproducing published works. In addition to well-cited examples of small sample size or inappropriate use of statistical tests, the ability to reproduce an experiment can be affected by lack of access to key reagents, or incomplete documentation of research protocols. So again, how many of you have tried to repeat an experiment that you've seen published and have failed to do so, and in many instances because the details that you need to redo that experiment aren't presented? <clears throat> you may or may not be aware that NIH actually has a site devoted to rigor and reproducibility. If you could go on there, uh, it's very interesting. There's a lot of information. A lot of it is um, for preclinical science, but they do talk about um, two of the cornerstones of science advancement are, are <clears throat> rigorate in redesigning and performing scientific research and the ability to reproduce biomedical research findings. The application of rigor ensures robust and unbiased experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of results. So it's a nice website if you have a chance to go on and and um, move around on it and see what they have to say. But one of the things that NIH has implemented that you're probably aware of is that since January of 2016, every grant now needs to follow these new guidelines. And one of them that I want to highlight here is the second <coughs> design, um, rigorous experimental design for robust and unbiased results. But then a new attachment for authentication of key biological resources. So now you actually need to provide authentication of your cell lines and the specificity of antibodies. So NIH is, is taking a long, hard look at this. They do have a nice uh, resource chart that you can download. 
<clears throat> and they do again talk about scientific rigor here. They give you the definition. And then again, under authentication, key biological reagents, and they tell you which ones you need to um, authenticate and how that needs to be done. Um, <clears throat> so with respect to authenticating reagents, this is that resource identification initiative. And this is from a, um, from a group that's looking to code all research reagents with a specific tag, much like a fingerprint. And so you could then look up a reagent that you're using. For instance, in this one, they've looked up a polyclonal GFAP from Invitrogen, an antibody, and it takes you into the website, and then it gives you the catalog number, but it gives you then the, um, the, RID, the RRID number that was assigned to it. So in using these identification numbers in a manuscript, if someone has used an antibody and lists what this RRID number is, you can then look that up and know exactly which antibody they use, because that's one of the issues we tend to run into quite often with antibodies is the name of the antibody will be listed, but the exact clone or where it was from isn't there. So this is an initiative that some journals have started to, um, to mandate in manuscripts that are submitted that you use RRIDs for most of your reagents. So <clears throat> that's, again, journals are starting to do that. And Journals Uniting for Reproducibility. So this is a, <clears throat> from a Nature editorial from 2014. And they've come up with some guidelines, <clears throat> which they hope will encourage journals to use a checklist to ensure the reporting of important experimental parameters. And they list some of these on here. They're ones that we've talked about and gone over. But this is one, for instance, from Nature Methods that I downloaded. And so once the paper is accepted, then there are all of these check boxes that need to be filled in as well as further information. And the one that interested me quite a bit were, was the antibodies. Describe the antibodies used and how they were validated for use in the system under study. So then I went over and looked and saw, well, how did they do it? So here's an antibody that they use, TTF1, polyclonal. And then the validation is Santa Cruz recommended this antibody for immunohistochemistry studies, observing nuclear localization in formal and fixed paraffin embedded lung tissue. Is that val is, does that validate the antibody? Absolutely not. They're relying on a manufacturer to say, oh, you can use this in lung tissue, which was not what this paper was about anyway. So, I mean, this is a good beginning, but I think that this probably should, in my opinion, should be given to the reviewers during the actual review of the manuscript. This is submitted after it's accepted. So I, to me, it's a good start, but it needs to be policed somehow. <clears throat> so in my role as, as editor, I rewrote this method section for our journal. And this is for imaging, because imaging experiments are oftentimes difficult to reproduce as well. So now if somebody submits a manuscript where they did uh, microscopy, they need to list the type and manufacture of the microscope, the objective lens specifications, type and manufacture of camera, acquisition software, the acquisition information, including all of this information, and for fluorescence, all of these settings. These are typically things that don't show up in papers, but we decided that they would be of importance and we need to know them for reproducibility. This is also from NIH from the, this open mic from November 8th and <clears throat> continuing steps to ensuring credibility of NIH research. So this one is now about journals, selecting journals with credible practices. So <clears throat> the scientific community is paying increasing attention to the quality practices of journals and publishers. And I, <clears throat> NIH recently released this guide notice to encourage authors the publishing journals that do not undermine the credibility, impact, and accuracy of their research findings. This notice aims to raise awareness about practices like charging publication fees without notice, lacking transparency in publication procedures, misrepresenting editorial boards, and or using suspicious peer review. If you're like me, you probably receive multiple emails per day asking you to submit a manuscript, typically to a journal, which 
has nothing to do with the type of research that you do. These are the accreditory journals. So all so the NIH is saying that all in all, to help convey the credibility of your work, be careful where you publish. We hope that our community publishes only in journals that do what they say they'll do. If the rigor of your work is clearly conveyed in writing and published in journals that maintain high quality standards, then your work will be viewed with respect. By taking these approaches, we can continue ensuring the credibility and trustworthiness of the biomedical and behavioral research findings resulting from public support. And obviously that's a, a very large issue because Congress has stepped in on this when they've heard about um, the reproducibility or lack of reproducibility issues. And so we do need to continue to, um, to work towards that. So this is just one, I don't know if you've seen this one, but um, <clears throat> this was an actual publication. So if you're a Seinfeld fan, you may know this um, episode on uromycetosis, which was a made up term. And it was basically an episode in which Jerry uh, was in the parking garage and basically they got lost and he was there for a while and he felt the urge that he had to go and there was no restroom and so he went and the security guard happened to see him and <laughs> took him away and he said i have uromycetosis and if i don't go when i need to i could die it will poison me and so there was a journal um a scientific writer and he has a really great name his name is john nick cool <laughs> and it's a real name, and he was tired of receiving these invitations every day to publish, and so he wrote this paper for this journal, Urology and Nephrology Open Access, which is a completely <laughs> fictitious case report about Jerry Seinfeld, and the paper was accepted after two days, and it was published, this is their website, and it was um, published until notification was made about this and then they quickly took it down but you can still you can still find it if you look at it it's um the author was martin van nostrand which was a uh, alter ego ego of um, kramer when he wanted to be the author. <laughs> and all of the names completely fictitious the references everything was fictitious and yet it was accepted within three days so some potential factors influencing rigor and reproducibility. So these are a few I thought about, and I thought this would lead us into a segue to the discussion. So some of the things I was thinking about, you know, pressure to publish in high impact journals, which can likely or can affect your promotion and tenure as a, as a faculty member. Pressure to obtain extramural grant support. Um, pressure from superiors to publish too soon. Journals seeking to publish attention grabbing studies scientific ego again from the book in the rat race um, harris says referring to scientists they need to get their next grant publish their next paper receive credit for everything they do they have stepped into a world where career motivations discourage best scientific practices okay so i tried to keep it within 20 minutes i think i did because we got a little bit later start so I thought that this would allow us to, um, to have a discussion about this. And again, there are a lot of people here I think can speak well about it. And so I'm just going to open it up for discussion. Questions? Questions, but this, I hope this discussion. Yes, so I'll say it's like reporting your weight on your driver's license application or doing your taxes yourself. We all fool ourselves into thinking we're doing this right, and very few of us probably are honest. Um, I think that in order to change, this needs to happen with current investigators who make funding decisions to begin with. So people who sit on study section, I know when I look at these outrageous grant proposals, let's say they're going to cure everything under the sun for $250,000 a year. I realize it's impossible for them to do what they say they're going to do. Even in their application, where they have signed and said that this is acting somewhat akin to a contract, there's no way they're going to be able to do what they say they're going to do with the money. If we impose upon ourselves what we say we're going to do in our um, validation section, it's going to take more time. It's going to take more personnel time. It's going to take more reagents. I think we need to think realistically about what people are proposing in their grant applications to do. And I'd like to say lowered expectations, but be more realistic 
about what we expect people to do in five years, in four years, with $250,000 a year. And it starts at the review of applications. And it's really coming upon ourselves to try to change the mindset because the public who pays for our work in most cases thinks we're doing all of this right. And in reality, I say we're not. They do, you're right. There has been a lot of trust in, in science and that's, it's, and that's being weakened by a lot of um, issues that have shown up in the, in the general press about failures of many of these studies. I mean, patients are waiting for cures and they're not forthcoming in many instances. And the, you know, the question is, is why? And is some of it due to rigor and reproducibility? Leonard. Yeah, just to add on to what Matt said here with respect to grants, that over the now 15, 17 years I've been here, grants are still the same normal amount of money attached to them. But we all know that costs have gone up, uh, in particular costs for, for uh, personnel. And so the amount of money we can actually spend on doing the real research has actually shrunk over the years per grant. True. So that doesn't, I mean, not to put the blame on anybody else, but the expectations has to be, you know, in, in line with what amount of money you have available to this, this Well, and, and many more investigators vying for a, a smaller piece of, you know, a smaller pie. There's just not as much yeah. money for the number of investigators who are applying for it. And, you know, <clears throat> the other issue is I think that the problem is that I saw as I started reading more deeply into this is that there are so many um, layers to this that need to be thought about and changed. And maybe Professor Irvin is our um, <coughs> associate dean of faculty affairs can speak about it. I mean, one of the issues that institutes have is looking at promotion and tenure and where are you publishing your papers? You talked about when um, John Bosch was here who's actually quoted in this book a couple of times, um, <clears throat> but the CNS papers and, you know, how many people are vying to get their results published in a journal like that, because that's what they need to move on. Along the, 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 the scandal there is the, the high correlation between retractions and impact factors. Yeah. There's several studies that have looked at that. And, um, all of us have had that experience where we look at a paper in one of the CNS journals and we say, really? Or we, many of, you know, there have been some of us that have tried some of these things that all didn't seem to work in our hands. Yeah. And then this very curious phenomena where there are certain people in our fields that where everything, everything they put their hands on comes up yeah. roses, everything. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we all get lucky at times, I suppose, but I certainly do, and I certainly haven't. And experiments that don't work, I mean, most of my experiments never work the first time. So I, the ones that do, those are the ones that get me nervous. <laughs> yeah. It's like I did something wrong. Yeah. There's, there's a whole, um, impact of the you know four studies that um, get published that really happens as far as um, patient care goes so um, a lot of the poor studies get into the literature and then um, an expert panel decides yes that's a good treatment and next thing you know it's in the supposedly evidence-based guidelines that um, you know that physicians and others are trying to follow, and so it's not just patients in a way that are waiting for treatments. It's the doctors are supposed to be and are trying to, for the most part, apply evidence-based medicine in their practice, and there are you know stuff that just does not work. Not even in, uh, doesn't work in the lab, and it definitely doesn't work in real life. In, in practice. So it's a really serious problem. John um, Ioannidis that you mentioned in the beginning has sort of made his kind of life's work into, uh, on the one hand, uh, I guess appreciating the idea of evidence-based medicine, but at the same time kind of saying a lot of the stuff that you're looking at as evidence is really 
not it's either slim or not there. So I mean, this has a huge amount of, of impact in, in real well, life. Well, in, in clinical research, the um, what you notice is that a single site study. So you do a yeah. study where you, right. you know, I recruit ten patients and I do something, like that. and then. Um, you, you roll that out as a multi-center trial, and it just this, the effect size goes down smaller yeah. and smaller. But um, the group that I work with, we've made a, our life's work in, in publishing negative trials, and it's very tough, yeah. very tough to get these published. And um, I mean, the two that I'm going to talk about one of these days when I get a chance are were based on really strong preclinical work uh, done on single site pilot study that looked very good. And then we rolled them out in a 19 center studies and total negative results. And, and, and they just baffled me. I don't understand why that is. It, and it, I guess it has to get back to the, the biases that Doug was talking about. You know, uh, well, I mean, some of it is is even, you know, more difficult than that. So one of the studies uh, mentioned in this book, so there was a group in Boston and a group in California um, working on some cancer cells, and they, they couldn't correlate their results. Doing the same work, they couldn't figure it out. They went back and forth. They checked everything, couldn't figure it out. So finally, they said, we have to get together with the bench and do this side by side. So they sat down to a postdoc side by side and they began doing their work and they got to a step with the cells where the cells needed to be mixed. And in California, they put them in a beaker with a spin bar and in Boston, they put them on a rotator, a, a, a rocker. rocker. That was the difference. Um, you know, I'm saying that was what caused the difference yeah. in their results. So when you're talking about these multi-center trials, unless everyone is doing it exactly the well, same way. That's and and, and um, there's all kinds of problems. I mean, you know, there's, 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 I mean, a friend of mine, one of the guys I trained in Denver went to work for one of the drug companies. We got talking about spirometry, which is my thing. He said, you have no idea how bad the, the data we get from our different clinical sites, which are mostly docs in practice trying to make some bucks on this. And it's, it's, you know, you, you look at it, it's really poor. And they're just grinding it out to get done and get paid. Do you have a comment? Sorry. Well, I, I have a question. Um, I'd like to, I'd like an opinion on, I'd like a consult. So imagine a situation where you find an error in someone else's published work. Um, <laughs> We're all talking about the challenges of policing ourselves. I think we all understand, like we agree that it's hard to do good science and it's important that we work together um, across sites to do good science. Um, sometime, I can think, I have an example myself, but certainly we've read recently about uh, cases where one researcher will bring to, to someone else, to an author's attention that there's an error and the author doesn't agree that there's an error and then you've got this position of like of course the author didn't make an error and of course the error is obvious to the external but you to the person reading the published paper where can we go from there to collaboratively make corrections to fix the errors that are in the literature like You've published negative trials. Do you ever do that with the authors of the original trials? Do you invite them to participate? We, we, we were the original trials, mm -hmm. and, and the, the pre, all the work was done by one of what, the colleagues who actually designed the trial. Gotcha. So, so but <clears throat> we could ask a, a journal editor, I mean, if, if, like, let's say you I mean, I can be very specific. There's yeah, a paper specific. that I've brought to the attention of peers here to make sure that I'm correct. Yeah. Is there an error in this analysis? And the answer is yes, there is an error in but the analysis published. of this, this published paper, published many, many years ago. Like how many years? 2000, I think. 
Oh I mean, God. like a long time ago. <laughs> 2,000 years ago? Wow. <laughs> wow. There's another tablet. I, I wasn't quite as white. Yeah. Um, so there's a paper published around the year 2000 um, that has an error in it that is now starting to sort of proliferate into other contexts. And I'm, um, I have been well, dragging my. The, the journal, the journal still exists? The journal still exists, but they've never, I looked, they don't have any examples of corrections or arguments about things that have been published. Like it's just not a thing. Well, you can bring they, it to the attention of the current editors, which are probably not the same people, although correct. they may. Um, you could certainly write a letter to the editor. There's a lot of interest in the publication world now on that question because really our choice now is to retract something, which is often involuntary, and that carries a scarlet letter with it that no one would. So journal editors are thinking about different degrees of correction that an author themselves can make to their articles. We had one, I'll give you one example. We're using PubMed Commons to do this on my own articles. We published one about 10 years ago. We published an observation. The methods have gotten better, and we realized that observation was wrong. So I went back onto our original paper and I said, the conclusions all stand here, but this one figure, and I referred to the new paper where we published the, the improved. So there are ways to do it, authors themselves. You're talking about if you've discovered something that somebody else has, has done. And um, I think that the evidence would show the most effective way right now to do that is uh, either by PubMed Commons or, or in a blog post. I mean, at most of the errors in the literature that have been flagged, have been flagged through blog, blog posts. The, that science paper on arsenic-based DNA, that was actually proven to be wrong within two days by discussions on blog posts. And the community immediately knew it was wrong and that led to, you know, led to the ultimate retraction. So that, that's not a great way to do it, but that you, for your own work, I think there are ways to do it, um, but, but they need to be refined so that they don't carry a stigma because actually we should be rewarded for correcting our own work. Right. But right now, yeah, there is a scarlet letter aspect to it. <clears throat> but correcting other people's work, I, I just think it's so important because, as you said, the mistake gets permeated. And, you know, some little subset of people know it's wrong and they don't base their experiments on that. But others who don't know, it can lead to lots of. Uh, Richard Harris talks about that. Right. And we find that the citations keep citing that original paper, even though it has been, say, debunked or, or proven, you know, proven wrong. The, um, the Begley paper, where they could only reproduce 11% of all those preclinical studies. Not one of those studies has been retracted, even though it's been proven that it's erroneous. Not one. They still stand in the literature, and they're still cited. <clears throat> now, um, to get to your point, Gary, the, um, for your own correction, one of the, one of the um, proposals out there is that, you know, in, I think in Vermont, I don't know if we still have it, but we used to have a tax-free day, Saturday or something like that in the spring. Mm -hmm. They're proposing a, a retraction day where people can go in, <laughs> no questions asked, and, and oh. pull one of their papers or pull a paper out and say, nope, I'm not even going to discuss it, and it just kind of goes away. To take away that stigma <laughs> of actually having to go through the entire process, that you can just go in and, and remove a paper from the literature because Gary's, you know, exactly right. People don't want to do that, you know, once it's out there. But you have a, a much more serious issue, which is you're finding an error in someone else's work. And, and how do you, you know, how do you approach that? There's, there's a pretty famous stuff. paper from about five years back in which um, researchers compared the leukocyte response to sepsis in humans and in appropriately validated mouse models and found that transcriptomic analysis found that there was no correlation between human and mice. It then called into question all immunologic research being done in mouse models. <clears throat> People looked at that and said that that's just not acceptable. And a, another group used the same data that had been deposited into the public, public repositories and did an alternative statistical methods analysis and found that there was almost 100% correlation <laughs> and published that as a new paper. So instead of going back to the editor and saying there was a fault in the statistical analysis, they actually wow. ran the experiments themselves. They used validated methods. And so I would say it might be incumbent upon you to try to publish your analysis of their system, your data, whatever it is, in another journal. 
and have it be 17 years more recent mm -hmm. and uh, see if that flies because that was really important to mouse immunobiology in general to have someone come out and that actually is where the blog the blog refutations have been most effective and there's a guy named Joab Gilad who's done that for a couple of key papers from Eric Lander for example that have been just stupidly wrong and he's gone in and actually taken the data and in his blog post reanalyze it so a key part of that is data accessibility and and that's something that some journals are sort of boldly pushing towards but other journals are resisting because of uh, the Doug's fifth bullet point, their scientific egos, that you really shouldn't be able to publish your result with the results without publishing the data. So exactly that kind of thing can go on. And, and that's a pretty non-threatening way to do it. If you take this, well, it's threatening, but at least you know you you, you have the data, you, you're, you're backing up your your contentions with the data. Um, but yeah, the data have to be available in order to do that. I think one of the things that's not sort of part of the conversation quite yet is um, not part of this conversation quite yet is the relationships in the scientific community. So I know the person who wrote this paper and I and I have told her I think it's wrong and she's told me that she thinks that it's not wrong in conversation before I did my research training. So at that time I wasn't able to say like wasn't able to really show her why I thought it was wrong. Now the data in the paper would let me redo another analysis and demonstrate where the mistake is. And I and it's this like, okay, do I go back to the original journal? Do I try and like co-author a paper with this person to say like this is where the mistake is? And those communications and and like how there's like no guidebook for there's no like Rules of well, etiquette for there's, uh, <laughs> that I have. There's common sense. I have none of that. It's just <laughs> <laughs> okay. So social common sense is not my thing. I <laughs> do not know how it works. Well, that's okay. I want it's, a guideline. It's important to understand. <laughs> I know we all have our weaknesses. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, it would be, I guess, as a colleague, you'd say, well, I could give her a chance. We could, here's my data. We could co-author something together. Um, she says no. Then you, you gave her a choice anyway. And then I, I like the idea of publishing a paper about it, frankly, whether it's in that journal or something similar. Um, you know, uh, it's really hard, though, when something's oh, published yeah. already to actually, the burden of proof is so much harder to argue against something oh, yeah. that's published because editors editors don't want to admit they did anything wrong either. So well, I, I, I agree that's the most rigorous way to do it, but that's not a good way for you to spend your time because it's gonna it's gonna take three or four times the amount of effort to get something to a publishable state. I was about to say that the guy who did my PhD was doing that. There was a, a study done in UCSF that was not only in the literature, it was in the textbooks. Um, and he spent a fair bit of his career showing it was dead wrong. But the number of studies he had to do in different animals in different settings to consist, consistently prove that it was wrong. Can I say one more thing and then I'll shut up? No, I actually, no, please. I actually think that a big part of the problem here is just our culture. And mm -hmm. we had a really robust culture of post publication commentary. And we didn't have this idea that because you published it in Journal of Immunology or Cell, it's correct, right? If we all sort of acknowledge that's not true, and we had this post-publication culture of commentary and realized that, that results evolve and, and ideas change over time, there wouldn't be this stigma associated with being wrong. And I just, for some reason, biologists, they just can't handle that. I and mean, my, my daughter's a graduate student in philosophy, you should see how they rip each other apart. And it's just part of their culture. It's just part of being an academic and being able to defend yourself and being able to give and take. But somehow we're, we're very tender flowers in biology. We can't, we can't handle that. And, and it would be really good for science if we could. And if we realize that every study, you know, that's just a, that's just a snapshot in time. And every bit of science evolves. And, and if we had a system to, sort of encourage that evolution, I think we'd be better off. So that doesn't address your the, question, the, how do you deal with it? The now? discipline I was in, we trained, it was vicious. We just 
we attack each other like crazy, but it's it's not the matter. But I think that while I agree 100%, it happens before publication. These are the kind of conversations that need to happen at Gordon conferences and Keystone Symposia and big international um, meetings where you actually can confront people in an open arena and not fight, but talk as scientists. And, and we have lost that. There was a person who was on my dissertation committee who has written a lot about this for the scientist. And um, it's just the culture has changed in the time that I've, the 20 years since I earned my PhD, um, we are a lot more quiet, defensive, yes. it, are scared too often. Is that what it is? It, you go to meetings and people don't ask the type of questions so that the they change I've did. seen at the, at the meetings I've gone to in four years is really stunning. It's gone from and, and people lines. won't talk about their recent yeah. work either. It's only published work at some meetings. It's, yeah. it's a shame. It used to be lineups to speak, but now it's hard to get anybody to ask anything. Mm -hmm. I, I think it comes down to the bottom line, and that's money. Because again, you know, when grants are down to everybody gets a score after a champagne cork, despite it's not fundable, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, in, in fact, most grants that get the score probably would have probably been funded, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And and uh, now we're down to some sort of lottery uh, to to win uh, a grant. Um, and uh, you need to be friends with everybody in that uh, committee. You can't <coughs> disturb any relationship. You can't run the risk of, of having anything happening to your grant. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what is driving us to be very protective about our things. So the scientific ego is not a healthy ego anymore. <coughs> I mean, I think clearly the, this discussion is showing that, as it's mentioned in this book and in, in countless articles, that it's broken. The scientific research endeavor, as we do it, is kind of broken for, you know, some of the reasons that you mentioned right there. Is that it's not, I mean, when I started out as a student, and as Charlie mentioned, things were much different. And it's, you know, it's it's changed, um, it's changed dramatically, and you're right. It's can add another thing to this, and, and it's still a bit of a difference between uh, Europe and, and the United States. And the, that the lack of structural money in, in our system here in the United States, meaning that very few people actually have a secure basis on which they can do what they do in philosophy, um, but they're probably less dependent on, on grants in, in the way we are in, in biology and medicine. Um, at least in Northern Europe, there's still some, some structural money in, in different research institutes. If you get a position there as a lecturer, professor, whatever, you have some funding that you can live off of and, and buy your mice or sell some readers, whatever you want. Like. But that, that is sort of dwindling down there too. <clears throat> I could be wrong, but we certainly have seen some pretty egregious cases come out of. I'm not saying, saying it's, it's not foolproof, of course not, but. Um, but but the literature is very clear in all of this, and that is that the, it's the training environment. Oh. And I think one of the reasons we're doing, so I have to make a plug, one of the reasons we're doing these is to actually have open discussions about it and to provide um, people who we train with, with, with the viewpoint. Because in the end of the day, it's your reputation. And your reputation is everything. And once you lose that, as I've seen in many cases, you're not getting it back. <clears throat> if you think about what incentivizes, just as I was just saying, those first bullet points, they're all just about incentives, right? And our incentive, and I think his last, that quote there is a great quote, just the way science is incentivized now promotes bad behavior. It is. <clears throat> all right, guys, well, oh, thanks for coming. That oh, point. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna. I mean, it's to that point where if you wanna, if you're in newer in the in the game, you have to to get a grant. You got to have your pilot funding, and your pilot projects are not really strong studies. But if you want to keep moving on the track, you got to publish them, right? And so you just kind of perpetuate this this rat race because you're publishing these premature studies because you're forced to do that in order to, to show you're productive. But the other thing is I think our system, the structure of our system promotes this where if I want to be, if I want to not be on completely soft money, I have to be um, in a tenure track position and a PI, 
when, you know, so we, so we have all these people that have to be independent investigators. And there's, a, there's systems with postdocs, but once you're out of the postdoc, then you need to be an, an assistant, you know, I mean, a, an independent, or you're gonna go into a, a very strong lab that will continually fund you, but it's still soft money. So we have this system that promotes all these people that don't necessarily need to be leading studies when it could be a, a bigger team approach. Well, that's being more and more recognized. Um, the NIH, particularly NCI, is pushing that very hard, the idea of team science. I went to uh, one of their team science things and they were saying how the universities have to, you guys have to change your promotion criteria. And I went, oh yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Harvard, how to change, yeah, right. Um, but here, we're actually pretty good at that. Uh, we use what is, I've come to know is a holistic, that's what you would call holistic uh, RPT review. We do, we do, we, we, we recognize people's contributions to the greater, uh, to the greater good. In fact, I can't think of a better example of that than my esteemed colleague uh, to, to my left. Um, and I think we do, and there's other places, Case Western, a couple of others, they're leading the charge. Not everybody is going to be a PI, but not because they don't want to or they can't or whatever. Um, we do work as teams. Certainly here in this institution, we've made changes to that, our policies to, to make sure that that continues to be the case. Uh, tenure is a dream because most places are going away from it. Um, and, and most of us with tenure believe in post-tenure review. Every five years, I should get heavily reviewed as to whether or not I still deserve that honorific, because tenure is not is not about wealth, you know, scientific welfare. It's about protecting the ability to say that, you know, the Earth is flat. Mr. Bowman, that one. So I mean, Mr. Bowman, a lot of them. Yeah, um, I can tell you some heinous ex examples of that. Where, the institution in one case came down on the person uh, just because of the money. There was money flow and influence within the, the university system. So it's, you know, it's not perfect. And we have, and that's why we have to have these conversations. And of course, we're all PhDs are on that road. And so we have degrees in philosophy. <laughs> and we practice at the top of our life. All right, thanks for coming. Happy holidays, and uh, hopefully we have a